we gather today with those that are here in this space and with those that are listening from home and we know that in this mysterious way we continue to be community together when we're together and when we're apart and we know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey you're welcome here God of grace, may this be the place. May this be the place for connection and growth, for community and hope. May this be the place for questions like, where are you from? And what do you need? May this be the place for whispers of, I have been thinking of you, and I have been meaning to ask, May this be the place, because all belong here. All are welcome here. All hurt and joy, needs and prayers, dreams and love are welcome here. May this be the place of God, for in this place you are near. into this place with the hope of growing deeper, with the hope of connecting, 
with the hope of glimpsing God. And if all those things take place and your spirit is moved and you swear God is near and you feel more than lucky for the gift of faith. And then the service comes to an end and it's time for you to leave and you ask yourself, where do we go from here? Then I would say to you, go out into the world to love and to share and to learn. But come back soon because this is the beginning. This is only the beginning. So come on in. Fill your cup here. Be present here. Know that God is here. Let us worship holy God.
deeply hopeful and a little nervous, all at the very same time. What I do know is, I don't want to go anywhere without you. So I'm hoping that you will take my hand, see this truth, trust my voice, look for the good. And day by day, we can go from here because we were never meant to go alone. And maybe we'll get lost. And then again, maybe we'll be found. So if you're willing, if you'll just say yes, I will let you hold the flashlight. And we can find our way step by step, light in hand, abolishing shadows together. Who needs a map when you have light anyway?
We know that you speak through dreams and prayer, through a still, small voice, and through bursts of overwhelming joy. We know that you are always speaking, but we also know that we are inclined to miss it. And so settle our spirits now to hear your word fully. We want to be part of the conversation. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. And so it was in the days when the judges ruled. There was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to live in the country of Moab. He and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and without her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. It has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, <clears throat> I will die there, while I be buried. May the Lord do thus, and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. May we hear the still speaking God in these words. God is still speaking. Isn't it amazing how life can change so swiftly on us? I think that's the understatement of the last two years. The book of Ruth is often thought to be a sweet, tender story with a romantic ending. Ruth is a nice young woman who cares for her mother-in-law. She finds a man and lives happily ever after. But the story is actually far more complex, 
and interesting and actually more relevant than that. One day Ruth was home in Moab before being taken by Malam or, or Chilean. From that point, her life script and orbits for that matter was completely torn into pieces. Then when the man died 10 years later, again, all that she would have known completely disappeared. And she was plunged into desperation along with her sister and mother-in-law. We never really know how life will move us along. We may plan and have goals and even hold winning strategies, but life isn't fair. Life has its own set of rules. And like Ruth, we find that our options become limited and our choices few. Go back, go forward, stand still. There are not a lot of other options for Ruth in this moment. There's uncertainty behind and there's uncertainty ahead. And yet the choices Ruth makes in this first chapter determine not just her own, but also Naomi's destiny. The vows she makes, the promises she makes in the midst of crisis, in the midst of grief, and in the midst of uncertainty, powerfully envision a very different future for herself and for her mother-in-law. Yes, her options were limited, but in Ruth's words and actions, we see the image of God in this story. A God that is interested in continuing the journey, continuing the conversation, of expanding those options for us and giving us hope amidst crisis. This story really does begin with a family in crisis. Elimelech, his wife Naomi, and their sons, Malon and Chilean, leave their home in Bethlehem because of a famine and move to Moab, which, despite being a near neighbor, held quite different cultural norms. But in this crisis of famine, Moab had bread, and Bethlehem, which in Hebrew means the house of bread did not. After the move, Elimelech dies, and soon his sons do as well, and the women were left alone at a time when there was no way for women to support themselves. They were left not just economically vulnerable, but completely bereft. Grief does that. It feels like a part of you is stuck in another moment in time. It's because grief demands to be felt. It crowds the heart, eats up your energy, chronically imposes upon your peace. Grieving is the bodily, the cognitive, emotional, and spiritual means through which humans deal with loss. Loss of something meaningful or a meaningful someone. The most obvious source of grief, of course, is the one that we see in this story, the loss of a spouse a parent, a child, a sibling, a friend. But many other losses can have a similar effect. Divorce, unemployment, illness, moving house, an empty nest, other life transitions. And yes, we are all experiencing a massive collective grief as a result of COVID and all the changes that have happened. Grief is the soul's cry of protest for those severed bonds and ruptured connections, all things that have been exacerbated during times of isolation and safe distancing. But too often we try to move grieving people too quickly through to healing. The story of Ruth and Naomi offers an inside look at grief. And God's ability to redefine the meaning of family and community, not just in times of joy, in times of goodness, in times of abundance, but in times of famine, in times of crisis, in times of great and lasting uncertainty. While only a few verses even mention the death of the father of two sons, 
There are doubtless thousands of unwritten pages of pain, emotion, and loss in the lives of Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah that we will never know. Not long ago, I came across a rewriting of Psalm 13. This is a psalm of lament that begins with the cry, How long? But in this rewriting, Reverend Julia Seymour reminds us that grief is not linear. This is what she writes. Cycles of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, or idols. They are mile markers on a highway I am not traveling. In my pain, I am not on a clearly marked trail, but bushwhacking through the bush, crossing unknown rivers, backtracking and circling to see the same spaces again and again. These alleged compass points meant to show progress in my journey are only useful if they're printed on a handkerchief. Then I'll wipe my face with them and see more clearly. I call out and I hear a chorus of false friends with easy platitudes, but they don't know this terrain. Only when I glimpse the shadows of fellow travelers on their own trails, when I hear the birds and watch the squirrels jump, when the water is clean and clear and full of life, then I remember I'm not alone. Everything is still hard, but I remember I'm not alone. So in the face of devastating loss, when it seems that everything is gone, it can be difficult to see who we're left with, what we're left with, what options lie before us. The path is rarely clear and it's certainly not linear. Naomi thought she had lost everything. But in these verses, we see she had Ruth. And through her presence, God had not abandoned her. We've experienced a lot of death and grief and loss in the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of racial brokenness, in the midst of economic disparity and political division and climate crises. And while it's fairly straightforward to recognize the responses of loved ones after death as grief, the many coronavirus-related losses are less tangible sometimes. Yet they're real nonetheless. And as such, they do invoke a grief response. The loss of the ability to gather the way that we used to. The loss of physical presence with a beloved family member or friend. The loss of control over events affecting one's children and one's own life. The loss of sense of security and overall well-being. These losses can be kind of hard to pin down in their vague and tangible character. Grief in the time of COVID-19 is complicated by the many locations that it can occupy in our lives, many of which involve losses where there's no body to bury. And there's often no definitive sense of closure as the loss stretches on and on through time. But just as for Naomi, God has not abandoned us. Instead, through Ruth, we see divine love and divine care and compassion in action. In Ruth, we see the image of God. She shows chesed. You have to really do the guttural sound there. Chesed. You have to really scrape it through. It's a Hebrew word that's often attributed to God's actions. It's sometimes translated in our Bibles as loving kindness. Two words kind of stuck right together. Or steadfast love. But I was introduced to another definition in seminary that I just can't let go of. It really describes something more akin to compassionate solidarity. A bond of love that knows how to witness to a person's suffering as well as to be present with them through it. Ruth so shows chesed to Naomi. Even when Naomi, in her bitterness, resists. Go home to the place you know, to the people you know, to the gods you know. 
Naomi's and Ruth's losses are very real, as real as the suffering it produces. But the bonds of love are not severed by loss. They remain. And when we can locate love in the midst of crisis, grief, and uncertainty, then we can be sure that God is present with us. Chesed, in compassionate solidarity. In a suffering world where the choices before us seem limited, Ruth speaks to us of possibilities. The vows she makes in verses 16 through 18 represent a hinge moment in the narrative on which much of the rest of the story turns. They bear the unmistakable marks of a covenantal promise. Ruth's comprehensive and unwavering impulse was to bind herself to Naomi and to Naomi's fate. This is compassionate solidarity in the truest sense. Ruth identifies her own life trajectory so completely with her mother-in-law's that it was what was true for the latter is true for the former. And I would venture to say that both Naomi and Ruth experience the inbreaking of God through their relationship with one another. And I believe the same can be true in our day for us. Human relationships, particularly in the midst of grief, sorrow, and fear, can and do reflect divine care. And even the covenantal care of a community. This kind of covenantal care envisions a community where all are fed, all are sheltered, all are comforted, all are seen. All are heard in celebration and in sorrow. Where pain and suffering aren't minimized or ignored. Where joy is the dominant note in the music of our community. And with hope for a different future, we can be bond together, bind together in solidarity with one another. Ruth's vows to Naomi establish a covenant of care that is much bigger than just the two of them, between two grieving women. They are a picture of a community of chesed, a community that seeks to live out compassionate solidarity in tangible ways, especially at times of both tangible and intangible loss. Can you imagine a world in which we took spiritual oaths like the ones we find in the book of Ruth? It's sometimes difficult to find things to look forward to when the future seems so uncertain. But what if as a covenant community together, we mirrored the chesed, the compassionate solidarity of God that Ruth demonstrates towards Naomi? What would our care and support to those who've lost loved ones look like? What would our prayer lives look like? Or our engagement in social justice in our city? How would our mission efforts to feed the hungry, shelter those without homes be impacted? How would we tend to each other's needs? Would you be more gentle with your own anxiety, your own stress, your own exhaustion? I hope you've heard the beautiful words of the song created just for this series that JR has been singing each week as part of our threshold moment. That opening of our time of, of worship, they're printed in the bulletin, but let me read them to you again. We all come from the dusty earth and from the places of our birth, ancestral stories, who will be? We bring it all together to come and see. We all have wounds that no one sees, oppression, trauma, and disease. When we bear witness to the pain, it can begin to heal again. We all need people who will be with us in solidarity. No explanation, no defense, just ministry 
of their presence. Surprised by God's unbandless love, from many walks of life we come to build a covenant of grace and in our differences embrace. Ruth's covenant of grace with Naomi, of chesed, compassionate solidarity, didn't deny or dismiss the hardship that they had all experienced together. Instead, it paints a picture, a vision of how human community can faithfully witness to grief and suffering and still find hope and comfort together. This, it seems to me, to be the message we need to hear in 2021. For when we open ourselves up to see the presence of God visible in the faces of those we are in relationship with here, we need not feel so alone or hopeless. Even though there may be uncertainty behind us and uncertainty ahead of us, we do not go alone. Amen. at times, 
standing in a place and time that's closer to the vision of your promised day where all are fed, prisoners are freed, homeless are housed, and every person knows their worth. And we know we can't get there without honest and vulnerable conversation, but we don't always know what to ask. We fear saying the wrong thing. We fear offending. So often we eat our words and stay quiet, hoping that answers will come, knowing that they don't always come. Connection is never quite as easy as it sounds. So today we ask for your words. Plant questions in us that like seeds grow into a garden of connection. Plant affirmation in us that like laughter is contagious and mood changing. Plant curiosity in us that like rain washes away words of judgment that come to our mind and replace it instead with a desire to understand other person. And when we have your words in our mouth and your mind in our hearts, then teach us how to listen. Teach us how to hear the message under the words. Teach us how to hear the grief, the hurt, the fear, the shame. Help us to hear and make space for those unspoken truths. And then teach us how to listen to voices that differ from us, voices with different opinions, with different histories, with different perspectives, so that like Ruth and Naomi, we might move through disagreement and ultimately find you. Oh God of conversation, we are here trying to be courageous, trying to be curious, trying to build connections. And so we need you, like we need this community, like we need the sunrise every morning. So draw nearer to us, teach us how to speak new words, teach us how to listen more deeply, teach us how to find you in the spaces between our words. Teach us to find you in the quiet spaces of listening. And by Christ's example, help us live lives of more courageous love. Help us live lives of compassionate solidarity. And help us begin by knowing that community can be found in the words that Jesus taught his followers, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The story of Ruth and Naomi is the story of God working through people. Naomi needed Ruth to make it back home and start afresh, ultimately. Mary, Mary needed Elizabeth. Jesus needed the disciples. Moses needed Aaron. The story of our faith is one that constantly reminds us that we cannot do this work alone. So family of faith, community of compassionate solidarity, I invite you to give your tithes and your offerings in whatever way you can, whether it's through the mail, the offering plates at the door, or through our website. And as you do, know that this is the work of community. This is the work of faith. So let us give with joyful heart.
generosity to conjure assumptions. The vulnerability to befriend. The bravery to speak your truth. The wisdom to listen. The strength to ask for help. The resili resiliency to seek love, even when it's hard. The awareness of the Holy Spirit always with you. In the name of the great connector, love itself, go, go in peace.